I don't know where my gal is. Where can she be? What is she doing? I've been looking and searching, asking questions all over town. My baby, I'm hoping she'll be found. I'm on the loose. So uh, the first segment of our show today, we're going to talk about uh, people asking questions all over town about Catherine, Princess of Wales. Uh, I should tell you, later in the show, we'll talk about another controversy involving Dan Schneider, a kind of content creator for Nickelodeon, uh, whose who's handling of young actors on the set, sometimes literal, literal handling of young actors on the set, has turned into something of a national conversation, if you think a lot of things on TikTok constitute a national conversation. Uh, and we'll uh, finish talking about the uh, Academy Awards acceptance speech by Jonathan Glazer, which has also turned into another kind of controversy. But yeah, uh, we're going to be in with Catherine, a Princess of Wales, a.k.a. Kate Middleton. And there's a piece that uh, ran in Lidhub a couple of years ago by a writer named pa- uh, Mark Deary. And I keep coming back to it. I went and reread part of it today. Every time we do a show, anything like this, uh, I'm back there. Uh, and he talks in particular about the idea. There's a, was a liter- literary concept concept called uh, the hermeneutics of suspicion. It's coined by a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur. Uh, and it refers to a form of textual analysis that assumes the narrative is there to conceal, not reveal. And, and Deary goes on to write how much this has become a state of mind instead of just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> a way of doing literary literary analysis. Yeah, he writes, the world is a text. Anything can be a sign, a symbol, disinformation, propaganda, psyops, a subliminal message, evidence of dark designs and covert ops. Um, and also quotes a literary theorist talking about how the entrenching of suspicion intensifies the impulse to decipher and to decode. So into this world we step uh, with uh, Catherine, Princess of Wales, and here to guide us through this whole controversy or this whole mystery is Tiffany Hsu, a technology reporter for the New York Times covering misinformation and disinformation and its origins, movement, and consequences. Welcome to our conversation. Thanks for having me. So this conceivably could have been a fairly cut and dried story. In Jan- mid-January, January 17th, Kensington Palace announces that uh, Kate is in the hospital for planned abdominal surgery and that she's unlikely to resume public duties before Easter, March 31st. Could have been end of story. We just wait until Easter. Um, that is not what happened. Do you have kind of a either a working hypothesis or a summary of what did happen? <laughs> huh. TikTok happened. Social media happened. Um, the the scores and scores and scores of um, armchair uh, detectives and amateur conspiracy theorists online is is what happened. They uh, realized that a princess who is normally fairly public had not been seen for several months, and they thought, hmm, the only conclusion that makes sense to us in this scenario is that. She is in hiding, she's missing, uh, or she's dying, or she's dead. Yeah, and I mean, once again, this means that a a mystery is being investigated by amateur sleuths on the internet, which is nothing new. What's odd about it was, once again, you know, the bare bones of it, it's not a mystery. They they said she had surgery. You're not going to see her for a while. But I guess... The, the other thing that's happening is this kind of amateur forensic sleuthing involves the analysis of pictures and anything that is released that could be examined will be examined with great suspicion. And, and that seemed to kind of play into the creation of a mystery where maybe there wasn't going to be one. Yeah, look, in the past few years, for, for, for a myriad of reasons, the public doesn't seem to trust authoritative sources like the palace, um, Kensington Palace, for for reasons that extend to, you know, they want to see the evidence themselves, or they feel entitled to know what what celebrities are are doing. They want to hear from these famous people um, directly, and so what happened with, or what is happening with Kate Middleton, uh, is that people are treated to this glut of content about her, and suddenly that spigot turns off, and they say, well, we don't have a lot to work with right now, so we're just going to hyper-analyze what we do have. And as a result, they're drawing conclusions that might not make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think a couple of other things kind of worth noting here. One of them is that um, 
the, the status of the royal family has changed over the decades. And uh, it was, I mean, the, the paradox here or the irony is that it used to be a very well-managed narrative. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's not so much anymore. It, it, it would have made sense to distrust anything that the palace was telling you, say, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, as we moved into the era uh, of Princess Diana and perhaps Sarah Ferguson as well, the royals became a little bit more like regular celebrities and a little bit less like people who could legitimately live behind an information wall. And And that's only become more and more intensely felt. I think a series like The Crown uh, also kind of bring bring some of these people down to the level where we f- feel like we can look at them and ask a lot of questions and that we deserve answers. Right. The expression of celebrity in general has has changed a lot, and the royals are definitely finding that out firsthand. You know, in, in the past, you had these these situations like with, with Paul McCartney. Um, back in 1969, there was a rumor that circulated uh, where people thought he had died a few years earlier in a car crash and that he'd been replaced by a doppelganger. Um, it, that was pretty rare um, back at that point because the availability of celebrity content was just so precisely managed and it was it was very limited. And, and what's happened since is that celebrities solicit um, public engagement. They offer up a lot of their own content to people. Like privacy is not a priority in, in today's celebrity ecosystem. And because of that, if you suddenly, as a celebrity, are not available to the public, the public starts to feel entitled to know what's up. They want to hear directly from you. And so you get this kind of demanding, um, aggressive tone from people who who have become accustomed to just a, a, an IV of, <laughs> of information about you to them. I would just like to pause in, in a fairly pathetic way to tell you that um, in 1969, I was a 14 or 15 year old uh, student at a boys' day school, and I happened to be sitting next to the headmaster at lunch one day, or he might have even called me over and said to me, I "Understand you're the expert in this whole Paul is dead thing. I wonder if you could explain <laughs> it to me." So, my poor headmaster then got like a 30 minute earful from me about you know all the clues to this. So yeah, it, it, but but one of the things that you wrote about too that I think is really interesting is the number of people who are suspected to be dead. And we should say that uh, an accompanying phenomenon is if you are dead, there are a lot of people who think you're alive, whether you're Elvis or JFK Jr., you know, that's a whole other other thing. You either have to prove you're dead if you're if you're dead or you have to prove you're alive if you're alive because either thing is subject to suspicion. Well, that, that's the interesting thing. That's actually what got me onto the story in the first place was I was thinking about Marilyn Monroe and I was thinking you know, this this poor lady is dead. She's been dead for a while. But in her memory, people are are saying, no, actually, she's alive. She's off kicking on some desert island with Tupac and Elvis somewhere. But but what's happening now is is actually a little more sinister in a lot of ways because the target isn't dead people who people think are actually alive. It's living people who people think are dead, right? So these are these are living, breathing humans who have lives, who who have family members who are now subject to, to these, you know, often kind of malicious rumors um so this this extends to avril lavigne who's been facing these rumors for well over a decade um those rumors about avril started from a blog that itself says people are way too susceptible to things that are are wildly un- unlikely um britney spears last year with the whole it's britney glitch or where is britney campaign people were analyzing her social media posts for signs that her eye color had changed or that her teeth looked different or that, you know, the flowers in her backyard were were kind of warped. Um, Joe Biden is a target of this. People think he's played by a number of actors like Jim Carrey. Um, Kanye West, who himself, people think, is a clone, has said that Elon Musk is a clone. Uh, John Fetterman, Jamie Foxx. Um, I could just go on and on and on. The, the number of celebrities that have to deal with this kind of rumor right now makes it feel like having to prove you're alive these days is is just part of the celebrity game. Yes. It's part of being a celebrity. 
I do want to say, I'm pretty sure Tupac is alive. Uh, I see two. I used to see Tupac <laughs> all the time in Farmington, Connecticut. But um, no, I, you know, I think there's that. And, and I don't want to necessarily blame season one of Serial for this, although I think it's a really good kind of uh, iconic example of it. I think we entered into a time uh, where everybody really is an amateur sleuth. And I think when Serial, Serial was running, there were people in real time on their own, reinvestigating that particular murder, that particular conviction. Um, and that then morphed into this incredible universe of true crime podcasts and other kinds of social media. Uh, it's now become kind of a subject of comedy on only murders in the building. But it, this mm -hmm. is a real thing that everybody kind of thinks that they are Sherlock Holmes right now. So if you give them something like Kate Middleton, they're going to chew on it. Yeah, the true crime obsession has a lot of hallmarks in common with this obsession with um, celebrity conspiracy theories. Uh, the the expert that I talked to, Moya Luckett from NYU, um, says that it comes from this need to feel like you're a participant. Um, it, this is something that stems from, you know, the prevalence of social media, right? We just, we want to be a part of people's lives and we're given this avenue where we feel like we can do that. And and because this has become so much of communal activity, this kind of online sleuthing um, in mass, that that there's also an investment to building a bigger mystery. Right? Her point was, if you're going to go down the rabbit hole with a bunch of other people, you want that rabbit hole to be really deep. Yeah, and so we should just say, or you should say a little bit about. I mean, things were put out there or found that in this case could be subjected to legitimate or illegitimate analysis. I'm talking about the Mother's Day photo. Mother's Day in England is in March, who knew? Um, and uh, some of the other kind of Bigfoot-like video evidence of the existence or non-existence uh, of Kate Middleton. Maybe you could say a little bit about those and what happened with them. Sure. Yeah. So the Mother's Day photo was was probably their their first and, and biggest um, faux pas. Right. They they issued this Kensington Palace issued this this photo that supposedly William had taken of Kate and their three kids. And Kate later admitted that she had edited the photo. I mean, she's an amateur photographer. She likes to mess around with photo editing tools, which sounds innocent enough, except that the internet got a hold of this photo. They had been looking for footage of Kate for weeks at this point, and they immediately noticed that there were there were strange things about it, right? <clears throat> like aspects of her clothing were off. Um, there were zippers that seemed to be awry. And, and to them, this was immediately a sign that the palace was hiding something. Um, following that, there were um, grainy... Photos of Kate in a car with her mother. Um, there were photos of Kate kind of looking away from the camera in a car with William. Um, people looked at those photos and they were like, that's Pippa Middleton. That's a lookalike. Um, you know, that's that's a um, an impersonator uh, or, or these photos have been um, AI manipulated. These definitely are Kate. Um, more recently, there was a uh, video of Kate and William walking near a store near their house, um, and people looked at that and said, this has been deep faked. Or, oh, if you use AI tools to um, kind of filter out the graininess of this video, you can tell that it's not Kate, without noting, of course, that a lot of these AI tools are are entirely unreliable because they're based on composites. Um, you know, people said she's too thin she's too healthy her hair doesn't look layered like it's supposed to be she doesn't have bodyguards surrounding her there's no way this is kate middleton right and all of these things can be easily um explained away um you know the the woman just got out of surgery of course she's probably thin but she has been recovering so makes sense that she you know is not confined to bed um at this point but uh, all that said is that if you if you give people um something that they they are going to try to use as evidence they're going to use the evidence no matter how flimsy it actually is yeah i think also it it is as you pointed out in, in your coverage there's a certain kind of person i think who gets subjected to this um the person that you focused i think the most in, in your piece was britney spears i mean besides kate middleton and there's there are some similarities there i think in the sense that there are 
there's this notion that there might be other people in control at any given moment. I mean, Britney Spears obviously is uh, pretty famously exploited by a, a conservatorship. Uh, you know, Kate Middleton is under the thrall of Buckingham Palace, whatever that amounts to these days. Uh, and, and I wonder if you think that that feeds into that impulse to question reality, question authority, question what seems to be the official truth, if there's some actual reason why maybe you shouldn't trust them. So there is there is a reason why the so-called Britney truthers are sometimes referred to as BAnon. It's a reference to QAnon, which is you know an increasingly popular um, conspiracy theory that's that's pro-Trump. And what it imagines is that there's a secret cabal of elites um, that are that are running the world and doing nefarious things, right? So the belief in that sort of um, of government entity or controlling entity is, is the same sort of belief that feeds into, um, you know, Kate Middleton is is being held captive by the palace or, you know, Britney Spears is being controlled by handlers who have a lookalike take her place in her social media accounts. Um, there's a movie that came out more than 20 years ago that I think is underappreciated, not for its artistic value. It's not actually a very good movie, but it it kind of prefaces a lot of what's happening now, right? It's called Simone, and it features Al Pacino as like a film director who uses a computer program called Simulation One to create this virtual actress. And audiences think she's real. They love her. And so the director keeps trying to hide the fact that she's been scene generated in like increasingly absurd ways. And there's there's a lot of... of um, there are many situations now that that mirror that sort of um that that seem like they mirror that sort of narrative right people people are uneasy these days like there's a lot of a, apocalyptic feeling in the air um between what's happening in our politics and climate change and race relations and 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 that sort of distrust and sense of discomfort is translating even into our celebrity conspiracy theories yeah, I think people, I, I, the point that you just made, and you made it in your article too, people are nervous. People are distrustful. Uh, and I think once you start to question authority about one thing, first of all, algorithmically, you will start to be tilted and guided toward other things. The, one of the ways that people become, I mean, I, I, you know, I live in Connecticut. One of the th reasons, the ways that people become Cindy Hook truthers is they start with something else. They're like flat earth conspiracists or they're Obama truthers, so to speak, or they're 9-11 truthers. And, and once you start swimming in those kind of RFK Jr. waters— you, you, it's pretty easy to swim to the next island. They all feel a little bit interconnected. Yeah, I mean, the, the joke, and it's it's actually not really a joke because in some ways it's true, is that all of these can be linked, right? If you, if you look at conspiracy theories about um, the elites wanting to um, warp agriculture so that they force people to eat bugs, like that, that actually has like a direct line to seemingly unrelated conspiracy theories about um, the 15 minute cities and and plans to um, try to restrict people to certain zones and not allow them to drive. And that's linked in part to Davos man related conspiracy theories about like the Illuminati um, there. It, it's all a web, right? These conspiracy theories are are designed so that if you follow a tendril, you're going to reach another node and then that's going to lead you down another tendril and so on and so on. And, and that's how people get looped in because they can just keep going and going and going. Yeah, we're all turning into Carrie Matheson and Homeland. You know, we've all got these kind of <laughs> me mental murder boards. with. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, just to sort of build on the point that you made, 10 years ago, uh, Britney Spears was introducing a lingerie line. Uh, and when she introduced it, she said that she was sending samples to none other than Kate, Kate Middleton, uh, Duchess, uh. then Duchess of Cambridge. And she said, I love, would love to see Kate in my underwear designs. Uh, she also had kind of a fairly public online crush on William before he got together with Kate. I mean, Britney did. So it's all connected, mm -hmm. Tiffany. It's <laughs> it's like my, my favorite my favorite visual representation of this is actually the Charlie Day meme from It's Always Sunny, mm. where he's he's standing in front of that wall with all the red lines pointing to like various um, various images. It's it's great. It perfectly visualizes <laughs> what this community is like. Yeah. 
Uh, Kate and Brittany are also both 42 years old. All right. I think that proves everything. No, I mean, first of all, thank you for the work, the work you're doing on this. I, I really do think that part of the epistemic crisis we're having right now is this crisis, the crisis that we're talking about right now, these kind mm -hmm. of invented narratives that sprawl and, and turn into webs. So uh, I look forward to reading more of your work. Tiffany Hsu, a technology reporter for The New York Times, covering misinformation and disinformation and its origins, movement and consequences. We're going to take a little break. We'll come back. We'll talk a little bit about Dan. We'll talk a lot about Dan Schneider, actually. All right. For some of you, some of you that would include me before a few hours ago, that's not going to recognize. That's not a recognizable song. Uh, if you are a Nickhead, if you are part of the Nickelodeon genera generation, you know exactly what that is. Uh, and for the same reason, th this story we're about to tackle here is one that didn't initially resonate with me. I'm way too old to be a, a Nickelodeon fan or to have been a Nickelodeon fan, and my son is, was not the right age at that moment either. So I never saw all these programs. Uh, I never saw Dr Drake and Josh, which that's the theme song from. Uh, no, all that. that. Actually, that was the theme song from all that. Uh, the Amanda Show, iCarly, Zoe 101, lots of other things. These were a series that introduced performers like Amanda Bynes, Nick Cannon, Ariana Grande, Keenan Thompson. Uh, but for a while, there has been uh, a, a drumbeat of concern about what was going on there. It, it didn't start uh, recently with the with the documentary Quiet on the Set. It's been longer than that. Uh, here to tell us a little bit about what's going on right now, the kind of reappraisal uh, of the Dan Schneider era uh, in Nickelodeon is Allison Foreman, a features writer at IndieWire, covering and critiquing TV films and trends in Hollywood. Uh, Allison has been covering this a lot. Uh, welcome to our conversation. Hey, Colin. Nice to meet you. So maybe just for beginners uh, who are not, you know, uh, aware of the story very much at all, if at all, give them just kind of a, a thumbnail sense of what this is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to give you a little background on me, um, I'll, I'll give you a little correction right up at the top. Okay. Um, that theme song was from Drake and Josh. You're right I got the first time. All right. um, no, you're good. You're good. Um, it's uh, I grew up in exactly that era. My parents probably know that song, um, you know, kind of like gunfire at this point because it was constantly <laughs> playing in our house. Um, but so those shows were hugely, hugely popular. Um, Drake and Josh, all that, the Amanda show were kind of this huge watershed moment that happened right around the 2000s, um, late 90s. Uh, it was largely helmed by a guy named Dan Schneider, who was considered this massive, massive Hollywood heavyweight. And it was sketch comedy for children. It was something that hadn't really been tried before. It was, you know, Saturday Night Live for kids. And that had a huge instantaneous audience. Um, this show that came out this week uh, aired over two days on Investigation Discovery and then came to Max. It's called uh, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. And it's the culmination of many years of people looking back at this period of children's entertainment and understanding that ultimately what happened, you know, at Nickelodeon, but also at places like Disney Channel was, you know, in many cases dangerous and, and not good for child actors. Right. Uh, we should say, yeah, that certainly going back a few years to books like I'm Glad My Mom Died and uh, by Jeanette McCurdy. And th this stuff has been around for a little while. But something about this documentary, Quiet on Set, has really fired it up even more. Um, let's hear a little clip from here. This is from episode one, Rising Stars, Rising Questions, Be One Cat. I will warn you, if you were a child of the 90s, this is going to ruin that for you. What do we really know about Dan Schneider? For decades, Dan seemed like he was untouchable. But around 2017, the internet videos around Dan really started gaining momentum. He made them do things that were very weird. There are all these setups that reference porn. <laughs> like squirting goo on Jamie Lynn's face when she's just 13 years old. Feel these kids' feet. 
Wow, they're really soft. People were looking back at old scenes and saying, Dan Schneider is obsessed with feet. Check this out. Felt very gross and foul Impossible to escape children's feet. Dan Schneider. Absolutely disgusting. He's a grown ass man. What the f are you doing? There's one video of Ariana Grande making a joke about a potato. Sometimes I wonder if you can get juice from a potato. Did that air on Nickelodeon? <laughs> Come on, give up the juice. Uh, that is Ariana Grande you hear at the end there. I don't even know if I want to describe to you what's happening. Uh, but Allison Foreman, this, the documentary has played a big role in igniting this. But so has TikTok. I, I, TikTok can be a great amplifier or a small amplifier. Here, I think because of the age of people who have a passionate concern about it, and also because of how elastic it is in allowing you to comment on something and comment on somebody else's TikTok that they made about something, it, it seems almost perfect to keep a story like this going. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So you're, you're talking a lot about this kind of generation that grew up with the Internet at the same time that these shows were, you know, aging poorly. Um, and so they were keeping up with a lot of these actors and, and they were more aware of this, it, it, I think, than many Hollywood outlets knew for a long time. I mean, this is a conversation that's been had across all types of social media. Um, but really what the documentary did is it did, um, you know, the two journalists who put that together, uh, uh, Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz, who directed all four episodes for Max, what they did is they effectively consolidated those accusations and those clips that have been so disturbing, those things that you heard into this docuseries, um, which helped it reach more audience members and help more people understand um you know, really what was going on there, but ultimately also, you know, was forwarding this conversation that's still unfolding online. There's a lot to unpack here. And and one of the things that I think is important to unpack is that obviously there's been a kind of soiling uh, of all these memories, the kinds of things that you were talking about from your own youth. And I mean, this, this guy, Dan Schneider, I mean, it's almost impossible to overstate um, what he was at his moment. He was referred to as the Norman Lear of children's television, the Aaron Sorkin of teen sitcoms, the Willy Wonka of television. I'm not sure what that means by Forbes. I mean, he was a huge force. But now this generation of people raised. I mean, let me get let me let me sort of offer a kind of somewhat different kind of example, which is with Michael Jackson. Everybody kind of can make their decision about Michael Jackson. Do you, do you want to, from now on, listen to his music as little as possible? Do you want to reject him? Do you sort of think, well, they didn't ever really prove anything in court? Besides, I like the music. This isn't one performer. This is like a year's worth of television memories for people more or less of your age. And, and could you say a little bit about that, about what you see people doing with all that, uh, if in fact it's all kind of contaminated? Well, it's complicated, right? Because, yeah, I mean, the context of it is rough. I mean, I, it, just listening to those clips, right, just even listening to those clips, not watching them, it's uncomfortable. Mm. Um, I think one of the things that's really worth noting is, you know, Dan Schneider in the wake of this documentary has come out and made an apology for a couple of things. But among in that apology was a call to have a lot of these clips that are, you know, perceived as sexual. He said that they weren't written sexually, but he understands that they've been criticized. He's wanted them pulled from Nickelodeon and pulled from reruns and pulled from streaming. And many actors have made the same calls. Child for, Former child actors who were in these scenes have for years said, I want them removed. But as of right now, you and I are talking, that footage is still unedited airing at Netflix and various other streaming platforms. I mean, it's on Paramount Plus, right? So there's a question of like, yes, people can revisit this material and maybe there's something to be said for enjoying television episodes that were created in a toxic environment. But the sexualizing co content itself is still making Nickelodeon money. And I think that's of concern. Yeah, and that's a very sharp knife's edge that we're exploring here. Because on the one hand, I'm sure a lot of those actors w would like those clips to be taken away or would like them not to be shown or to be shown at least maybe with commentary about them or whatever. But the more that you do that, the more that you expunge that, the more you're effectively serving the interest of the other side. The other side, people like Dan Schneider, would probably like the evidence suppressed, so to speak. Yep. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about those two things which seem to be in conflict. 
Yeah, that's really well put. And and that's why it's such a complicated issue. Um, One of the difficulties, right, is here you've got a documentary that is recirculating clips that themselves are objectionable, that you've got a question of who should see this, who was this for, why was this made? But there's a question to be said for, yes, it's it's abuse that was put on, you know, it's documented and is horrific for the people who experienced it, for the survivors who have talked about it. But then you also have somebody like Dan Schneider where it's like, yeah, that's that's embarrassing material for that creative. Um, so it's a question of journalism, right? And and I think it was interesting. I spoke with Alexa Nicholas, who was an actress earlier this week for a piece at IndieWire who, um, who was on Zoe 101 and was uh, part of that goo scene that you heard referenced in that clip, right, where this awful experience that she had with Jamie Lynn Spears. And she told me she was comfortable with having that put in the documentary in no small part because she was also interviewed for the documentary. So she was able to give it context. Um, but, you know, she also mentioned to me that it was, you know, something where it's like if there are actors who didn't want to be in this, who look back on some of the clips that were included in the documentary, that that in and of itself is kind of a violation. So it's a very sticky situation. Um, but the material is out there. The material is viral. Anything that exists in the documentary already exists on the Internet tenfold. And again, some of that is still making money for Nickelodeon. Yeah, I think also uh, it, not every actor is in the same position. I, by the way, watched some Alexandra Nicholas stuff uh, on YouTube and uh, on on TikTok. She's obviously become kind of an activist about this. I mean, she's getting out in front and, and bringing some of the evidence forward and on her own describing what some of the problems are. But, you know, you look at some of the other people that we've mentioned. I mean, first of all, Amanda Bynes is in a obviously very precarious situation. She's had some pretty significant mental health problems. Um you know, some of these other performers, maybe, I don't know what Ariana, Ariana Grande has said about this, if anything, but some of them might just want to be getting on with their career and not have everybody look at them and think, oh, yes, that's one of the exploited people, you know, the one of the people who was uh, abused by Dan Schneider when, at a vulnerable moment. Maybe people don't always want to be understood that way. Yeah, well, I think that's a completely reasonable thing, right? I mean, with, with the with the Amanda Bynes situation, it's it's pretty awful because, you know, obviously this is somebody who's been of public interest for some time, um, who is not in the documentary and who has not gone on record making some of the allegations that are, you know, being recirculated on TikTok, just misinformation about things that have not been officially reported, you know, things that aren't out there that, you know, because either because they didn't happen or because she doesn't want them out there. And that's something that's difficult as you watch some of this stuff kind of get run away with. And, and there's a reality too. I mean, important to remember, this is ultimately also a true crime series. And that's a very, very sticky area to get into because, you know, when does gen- journalism become entertainment? When does, you know, exposing something become exploiting something? It's always going to be that knife's edge, like you said. Yeah. And I mean, it, it sort of connects back to some of the stuff I was talking to Tiffany Shu about in the previous segment. I was on uh, TikTok today looking at some of this stuff and people were taking, I don't know, some public note that Amanda Bynes did put up about something else, but she seemed to have some arbitrarily capitalized words in it. And they supposedly spelled out Dan S. did it or something like that. Uh, and I mean, this is the other thing that happens. You're absolutely right. People start to treat this stuff as entertainment. You know, if you go think back to that first season of Serial, a couple of times the family of the victim did come forward and say, look, our daughter was murdered by somebody and this isn't fun. It's not a fun thing. You guys are treating it like this fun wild goose chase that you can go on. And and that's the repurposing of all this stuff and the constant palpating of, of all of it on places like TikTok. You, you just wonder whether it's, as you were suggesting, kind of an appropriate way to talk about stuff that really is very painful for some of the people who went through it. Completely. And I mean, and that's, you know, that's something that doesn't just exist on social media. I mean, that's, that's why it's an issue, right? We can criticize, you know, uh, anybody who's on social media, who's doing something like making an acrostic out of an old Amanda Bynes tweet, right? Like that's, that kind of stuff. It's, it's Taylor Swift era, you know, fan theory. That's completely inappropriate, but that's just a thing that people do. The problem is it does also exist in Hollywood. I mean, some of what happens in the true crime space is really, really unethical. Um, Things get made frequently against families' wishes, against survivors' wishes. Because, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's fact. It's not a story. You don't write a script. It's something that happened to you. And in a way, that then becomes owned by the public. And that's much worse when you add the meta layer of those sort of parasocial relationships of a victim or an attacker who you met in the context of them being an actor or a celebrity as somebody who's trying to judge that as a lay person, right? I mean, it's it's important to remember that we're all part of the same society and seeking justice on the same front, but 
Hollywood changes the way that we see people and it changes what we think they're owed um, in every direction. I mean, in a way, there's there's some really good things about this. Um, and I think about the whole history of this with Hollywood. You go way, way back to Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney yeah, as child performers. They were given drugs. <laughs> they were given drugs to perk them up or to help them sleep. Uh, they were made to do things to kind of preserve the the illusion of youthfulness when they were no longer really all that youthful. Uh, you know, Judy Garland was in, uh, encouraged to you know live on a diet of like chicken soup and cigarettes, basically. Um, and and it was all happening pretty much behind a curtain that got pulled back. I mean, I'll, I'll give you yeah, I'll give ahead. you a fun fact, Colin. Yeah. The very first child actor, Jackie Coogan, very first child actor, yeah. took his parents to court because they stole his money. Yeah, I mean, it, you're talking you're talking the 1940s. Very first child actor. <laughs> right. So you look at that, and you look at this, and you sit and think, well, here's a generation of performers, some of whom are trying to take care control of their own narrative and their own destiny, and also to pull back the curtain a little bit closer to real time. Uh, and and one would hope anyway that potential Dan Schneiders of the future would be now warned that this is going to be less easy to get away with. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and that's, that's the thing, right? Is anything like this when you, social media is great in terms of creating a firestorm. It, it really does help platform things. It does help make an issue like this more visible. It brings it into the homes of people who may not have thought about these Nickelodeon shows in years. You know, parents who remember their kids seeing them but didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes. That's all great. The problem is just when you do get this kind of thing sort of elevated to that level, the control gets taken away from the people who it happened to all over again. And that's, you know, that's a consequence sometimes of seeking justice. But when you have so many victims, there's not going to be a one size fits all answer for everyone here. So while, you know, a documentary like this, while Quiet on Set might really be vindicating and very healing for some people, uh, other former child actors who are featured in it may not feel that way. Um, and that's, you know, that's a complicated thing um, for an audience to try and parse through in an already complicated situation. That's a really well put and, and a, maybe a good place to sum up. So Allison Foreman, features writer at IndieWire, covering and critiquing TV, film and trends in Hollywood. People should check out her work, particularly her work on this topic. We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about yet another controversy. This one from a well-intentioned, I think, Oscar acceptance speech. Careful the things you say. Children will listen Careful the things you do Children will see And learn You can follow The Colin McEnroe Show on Facebook or Twitter at Colin McShow. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to or following our podcast on any podcast app. It's free. You don't have to wait an hour after eating before you go swimming. That's just something our mothers believed. Back to the show. Yes, and uh, thanks to Kat Pastor. She's our technical producer today and most days. Uh, Jonathan McPants is the producer of this episode. Uh, we're going to finish the show with a discussion of a an Academy Awards acceptance speech that turned controversial. Before I even introduce our guest, let me set the scene here. The Zone of Interest won Best International Film at the Oscars. It's based loosely on a Martin Amos novel about the Nazi officers and their families living adjacent to a concentration camp. Uh, Jonathan Glazer, the producer, uh, stepped forward to receive this award, although I'm told that technically uh, Glazer did not win an Oscar. The United Kingdom won the Oscar. I don't know. I don't understand these things. Uh, anyway, here's a little bit of what he had to say. C1. All our choices were made to reflect and confront us in the present, not to say, look what they did then, rather look what we do now. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? Joining us now uh, is Pete Hammond, awards columnist and chief film critic at Deadline. Uh, he has written a, a very powerful piece about this uh, as well. Uh, Pete Hammond, welcome to our conversation. Hi there. 
So you listen, How are you? You, I'm fine. You listen to the clip and there's applause in the background. It's pretty clear, I think, what he's trying to say. Um, somehow or other, it didn't stop there. And before you knew it, there was an open letter, I think initially signed by about 450 people from the industry, and then more people signed it, it got up to around 1,000. So say a little bit more about what happened. How did this turn into a controversy? Yeah, it's interesting uh, because I was at the Oscars, actually, sitting in the first mezzanine. And um, uh, so I don't think it registered quite when it was happening when his speech was happening in fact i was sitting next to a very prominent uh jewish director who's born in tel aviv uh has made films connected to it i won't mention his name only because i don't want to speak for him but he was very excited about the international film coming up he kept asking me where when's it coming up when's it coming up because i had the program and uh i said uh, shortly and and he was a big supporter of that movie i not, I think he was confused by the speech. You know, I uh, he didn't show any outrage or anything like that, and and didn't really say anything. But I noticed there was a bit of discomfort, maybe because he didn't quite understand what he meant or what he was saying. And I think that was true with the audience at large. This only happened after people started focusing on all the words. And you know what happened. Uh, they start cutting down the thing. They start uh, only only uh, talking about one line or one thing. Refute Jewishness, I think, is mm -hmm. what stood out to so many people. That, if you read in the context of the whole speech, uh, you know, takes on m different meanings. But uh, without that context, uh, you know, th uh, this thing just sort of lit a fire in the industry. And uh, and that's what caused the uh, letter of condemnation by many prominent people and pro some pro very prominent members of the Academy as well. But this is something that took hold after, after that night. And uh, instead of that night, as in the case of in, in the past controversies like Vanessa Redgrave, when right. she won in 1978 for Julia and, you know, uh, addressed uh, uh, what she uh, labeled Zionist uh, very negatively uh, in her speech and got instant booze and things. I, I didn't feel that was what was happening here with him. No, I, I think people weren't confused about what Vanessa Redgrave was saying. <laughs> I think it was yeah. very clear what, what point she was making. But I think you're right to say confused. And, and I keep coming back to the idea that what Jonathan Glazer maybe needed was an editor. Uh, yeah. and, and maybe an editor named Co Tony Kushner. Tony Kushner, over the course of defending Glazer, said the following. He said, what Glazer's saying is so, so simple. He's saying Jewishness, Jewish identity, Jewish history, the history of the Holocaust, the history of Jewish suffering must not be used in a campaign as an excuse for a project of dehumanizing or slaughtering other people. This is a misappropriation of what it means to be a Jew, what the Holocaust meant. And he, Glazer, rejects that. Um, that's clear. That's exactly right, yeah. because, you know, he prefaced his statement uh, there. You know, Glazer did, as you just showed, our film shows where dehumanization leads at the worst. <laughs> his film is showing dehumanization in its own unique way. I thought it was an I saw it before anybody saw it. I saw it at the Cannes Film Festival at 830 in the morning as a film critic going on. All I knew was it was one line about Nazi commandant lives across from Auschwitz. That's all it said. And Cannes doesn't give you a whole lot of information. And those movies are always world premieres. So I didn't know what I was getting into. And I went and I walked out just blown away by this movie. I'd never seen a movie like it, like it was what I said in my review. And other critics felt the same way uh, once it was shown. So, you know, it's 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 not the film here. It's just the wording on Oscar night. That yeah, confused. I think you just identified two points of this wording. I think we, yeah, we, we both agree. And then it's on Oscar night. And I think a couple of things happen there. And you, you did a terrific piece on what happens when people try to bring political statements into Oscar night. But I think one thing that happens to Glazer, and I noticed it more listening to the clip just this time, is you're, you're implicitly on a clock. You know, you don't really know what the clock is. And depending on how big a star you are, you either worry about the clock or you don't worry about the clock. Um, but Glazer goes kind of fast. First of all, ironically, he apologizes for having to read it. Uh, and, yeah. and then it's written in such a way that it is somewhat easily misinterpreted. Uh, yeah. and, and, and he goes kind of fast. Like, if you're going to write like that, if you're going to make a fairly subtle point, 
um, and you're going to kind of run two ideas kind of close to one another. You probably want to read slowly, kind of pause for the punctuation, let the nuance settle in. But like you're saying about the guy sitting next to you, it was like a freight train going by him. And right. he thought, what did he just say? <laughs> yeah. I, I, is, this, is this the guy that made this movie that I so love, you know, that says so much to me? And and this is a very prominent um, director who was literally born in Tel Aviv and, um, you know, I you know, I've known him for a while. He just, I just happened to be sitting next to him. That was by accident. But um, it was interesting to see his reaction afterwards because before he couldn't wait for the category and for this to win. So that was unique. Yeah. And, and as my producer is pointing out, he's nervous too. He knows almost no matter what he Glazer says, it's going to create a storm probably. Uh, And so when you're nervous, sometimes you don't read as emphat- emphatically or as clearly as you possibly also, could. Also, yeah. Glazer is a very interesting director. Unlike so many others in the Academy Awards process, he wasn't out there personally campaigning uh, in any big way. In fact, I never got near him in the six months of uh uh, Oscar season uh, in terms of interviews and things. He sort of stayed away. His producers, Jim Wilson, who was on stage there and others, did a lot of it. But he didn't do a whole lot of, you know, glad handing and things there. So this was actually one of the first times I'd actually seen him all season in uh, talking about things. And of course, he's doing it on on a global stage there at the Oscars. And you mentioned something that's interesting that I don't think a lot of people realize too. He is not listed as an Academy Award winner. It is the UK that is the one that, that's always been the case with the foreign language film category. It goes to the country, but in recent years, it's been, you know, the director gets the Oscar, but not the uh, notification that they're an Oscar winner. It's always the film and the country that are considered the winners here. So I don't know that the UK has had anything to say about this, but they're the ones that got this Oscar. Yeah. We only have a minute or two left, uh, Pete. And I I do want to say that, I mean, you did such a beautiful job of kind of laying out all of the valences that come up around political speech at the time of the Oscars or just by entertainers. Hey, I love Robert De Niro. I think he's one of the greatest actors ever. You know, whenever he talks about Trump, I feel, boy, somebody could do this a lot better than you're doing it. You're just dropping (laughs) F-bombs, Bob. And, and, And with this particular telecast, you know, there was a whole question that you explored talking to Jimmy Kimmel, the MC or host or whatever, uh, right. at, about with how much political stuff was he going to do? And then he got kind of blindsided by the truth social thing by, by Trump uh, criticizing him. And he made a pretty artful pivot over towards tackling that. He did against the advice of his wife, who's the executive producer and others there, because I talked to them right after at the governor's ball. And, uh, you know, Jimmy had told me before the ceremony, only if he couldn't resist would he go there. He says, I have my show to do that stuff. Uh, Well, obviously it was handed to him. And the fact that the show was running short and he was suddenly told, you've got to vamp for two and a half minutes. He (laughs) said, I made the decision. I'm going to do this. And it was all very spur of the moment, very unusually that the Oscar show runs short. But all these things uh, were um, uh, joining together for the perfect storm for him to to do that. That's right. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I was about to say it could be that the most historic moment in the entire Oscars is not Jonathan Glazer or anything else. It's Jimmy Kimmel saying we're running short. <laughs> like, that exactly. never happens. That never happens. No, that's, that's... that that never happens. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, this is fascinating stuff and, and your work on it has been great and we were so happy to have you with us today. So, uh, first of all, Pete Hammond uh, from Deadline, thank you very much and thank you for listening. Thanks to McPants and Cat Pastor, and we'll be back next week with a whole bunch of shows. When it's cold and gray outside, and the streets are filled with snow, when you're drinking lots of coffee, and the words begin to flow, when you're lonely, and you got no place to go, I see you on the radio, oh yeah. I see you on the radio, oh Lord, down on Colin McEnroe, that's right, I see you on the radio, mm-hmm. let me tell you baby, I'll meet you down on a silo, across from St. Francis, past the conservatory, up the street from the seminary, you know we
Muito bem.